Well, hi and welcome to the uh, latest edition of the Sports Think Tank and Sport 80's Think Pieces. Uh, today we're going to be looking really at the post-COVID recovery for national governing bodies and sports and physical activity in general, uh, and specifically how people have been engaging with their membership and what that might look like in the future. So delighted again just to be joined by a couple of people who can really add some, some weight to what we're talking about today. So Johnny again from Sport 80, I'll let you introduce yourself and uh, what you do over there at Sport 80 in a bit. And also Mark uh, is joining us today from uh, uh, Rock Car Creative and we're really looking forward to sort of the insight that you bring both from the sport and physical activity sort of sector. So Johnny do you want to just sort of kick off with uh, yourself? Yeah sure thanks Andy so I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Sport 80 so very heavily involved in, in all of our operational activity and what we deliver from a, a client perspective in terms of our technology and, and our services that surround it and um, at the moment, we're focusing really heavily on what else we can bring to our to our service wrap and our offering to try and help national governing bodies add value to what they're delivering to their customers and also to try and make our offering more powerful as well. And, and, and that's where Mark comes in in terms of our, our partnership with Rocker. Um, so I'll, I'll pass over to Mark to, to introduce himself. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm Mark Rocker. I'm CEO of Rocker Creative and we are a creative technology organization with a focus in sport and physical activity engagement so we work with national governing bodies in sport but also with um, entire cities in uh, engaging people to be more active so I'm, I'm kind of a geek in terms of people engagement as well <laughs> well, we like geeks with people engagement. That's absolutely perfect. <laughs> Delighted to have you with us. Um, as I say, we're really sort of focusing, I suppose, on, um, you know, hopefully you'll highlight some of the facts and figures behind the, uh, the, 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 the depth at which, you know, sports and physical activity was impacted during that COVID period. But now, you know, things have opened up, started to open up, fans are returning. But most important, I guess, for national governing bodies is how they sort of recover that connection with the, the, the membership. You know, I know as a rugby player who's probably retired this year, so I know I'm going to try to be dragging me out for one more season, but it ain't going to be happening. Um, but, you know, genuinely, I'm sure every CEO in NGB is really working quite hard on, on that. So I don't know, um, Mark, from your experience, you know, sort of working with, with, with these people, um, what's sort of happening on the ground? What's it, what's it looking like? And are there any strengths and weaknesses we need to highlight? And what more could we do to really make that journey back into sport and physical activity a, a, a lot easier for people? Yeah, I think, you know, as a, as a broad brush overview of sport and sport engagement, it's literally halved across the piece. So there are uh, some interesting stats coming out the likes of uh, two circles that demonstrate that um, sport engagement and actually physical activity engagement in the round has pretty much cut in two. Uh, and by engagement, I mean participation, but also uh, things like volunteering. So it's not just a case of getting you know people to play the sport again, but it's it's re-engaging volunteers and, and and people who make the wheels go around in sport. Uh, and Johnny, from obviously our perspective at Sport Eighty in particular, the sort of the role of that um, you know the, the system behind it and how sport works is there, is there anything that you're looking at uh, you know sort of having learned lessons during COVID of that level of engagement? What more can be done in that partnership between yourself and Mark? Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, there's there's probably two things, Andy, that that we've seen is that there's been a dramatic shift from. Um, I'd say a cautious approach to digital transformation in the years leading into 2019 uh, and there's been a more aggressive shift now towards uh, I think every NGB looking at what's our strategy, how do we use digital because everybody's had to use it whilst we've all been working remotely, now it's a, now it's a case of actually looking at what do we have, what options are there out there to make our offering more streamlined and more exciting to our to our customer base and that could be anybody from a, some, someone that's a, a rugby player like yourself that's wanting to become a member and participate it might be a volunteer or a coach or somebody else that's involved in the sport so there's kind of been this shift now towards people really engaging in what the solutions are that are out there and then the reality of that situation is how do we make those all work together because there are lots of people out in the industry doing different things um, and the important thing from our perspective now is how do we bring what we believe anyway to be the best of breed from within the sector together, working harmoniously, not just in terms of how do we operate and how do we make the customer feel that they're getting what they need and the value. So 
I think a really good example that, that between ourselves and Rocker is the work we've done with Jameson in England. Um, we, we focus on their core business operation day to day. So that is how do they get their members in? How do they collect their money? How do they collect event registrations? How do they put their sanctions on and, and events get events onto their national calendars? How do they manage their coaches through their coaching journey, whether that's being cert becoming a certified coach, getting on a register, all of that kind of stuff. And then we have their whole grassroots operation, their league network, their club network, which which Rocker has worked closely with us in Table Tennis England to develop a, a solution. And those two systems need to work together, as well as the two businesses plus Table Tennis England. And knowing that we can all do that and we have a working relationship established, I think has made a, a huge difference to the way that Table Tennis England have been able to, to build that out. So I think there's there's this shift now towards people really engaging in, we need to use technology. And the second part to it is, what are all the pieces, all of the building blocks that actually form the offering? Um, and I think that's where we come in and that's where we're seeing the growth, I think. Lots of people just shifted quickly last year and now it's what do people really want and what do they need? Yeah, I think people obviously sort of get that, don't they? Um, but I think as we've spoken before, it's sometimes just trying to interpret what that means in reality. So we talk about data and using technology and social media and, you know, um, some of us are getting a little bit along in the tooth and, you know, things move very rapidly, don't they? I look back at even 2012 uh, to 20 with the Olympics going on at the moment, just how different some of the technology we were talking about then, uh, they're now just really, really mainstream. And, you know, how, how does any sports person survive without TikTok, which, you know, not really around all that long, is it? You know, I mean, you think how fast they go. So there's lots of varieties of what we mean by data and digital and et cetera. So, so which do you think, Mark, have sort of been the most successful, you know, those the best examples NGBs have got? And, and talk a little bit about that table tennis sort of journey, because, you know, that's a classic, really, isn't it? Yeah, I think Table Tennis England is kind of an exemplar for us, and it, it, it set my organisation and Sport 80 on a path of uh, building out opportunity for NGBs and looking at a future space for tech and sport in general. Um, so between the membership platform that is Sport 80 and the event league and fixtures management platform that is TT Leagues, we've got a, a, a whole life journey of the participant if you like so those people taking part in the sport are members of course but uh, and it's great to see how many members you've got for example and it's great to be able to run leagues but it's not until you put those two pieces together that you mm. start to get a really broad and rich picture of who's playing in what region how much how does that data split into ethnicity and gender and so on and so forth? So the power of the data really comes to life when you start to integrate two platforms that are on, on the level that TT leagues and Sport ATR. Yeah. Yeah, because that's crucial, isn't it? It's quite interesting when you were speaking there, Johnny, about sort of the two systems and all the rest of it. But as an individual who plays or is involved in table tennis, you just see yourself, you, do, you, you don't think you sit in different systems and other pieces. Yeah. So going back to your experience, and or, or both of you really, um, I think there's a wider discussion here, which I know is happening a little bit with Sport England, but but what does membership mean? Um, and yeah. and we, often we've probably seen it from a, an NGB perspective as a neat way to categorise people and collect their subs and, and, and other pieces, whereas increasingly that concept of, of, of membership and ownership is is changing isn't it you know millennials have a very different sort of view of that so how will that impact what we're sort of doing in the future both of you is there you know do you sort of seeing what that looks like i think we are starting to see some of those kind of initial seeds that have been sown over the last few years with companies like ourselves trying to to get national governing bodies and other organizations to think about what we kind of term the 360 view so if I am um, if I'm a national governing body and I want to be able to do all the things that Mark was was discussing just now around who are our customers and actually our customer base spans a number of different people, which actually historically, Andy, you're right, when we've gone in to work with national governing bodies, typically those people have been broken out by membership types. Um, that's how we recognize who, who a coach is, who a parent is, who a fan is. And actually, those people can be identified through lots of different strands and through their activity um, going through different systems, ultimately. Um, I think a really good example in one, one of our organisations in particular has done this very successfully, has been the pivot through the pandemic 
into utilizing learning management software and getting their coaching journeys online as well as being delivered in person and usa weightlifting over in, in the united states have have made a very successful transition to getting all of their coaching services online we've integrated that in the same sort of way that we've just discussed with with mark around how we've delivered the tt leagues process and we've enabled a, an end-to-end -end solution that actually the end user doesn't necessarily need to know that they're going into any other system but the core place they start is the national governing bodies platform and the, the more the national governing body can emphasize the individual's journey with that sport starts here, and that in turn gives the NGB the knowledge around who those individuals are, what they are doing, what their level of spend is, that might be important in certain scenarios, what their level of activity is, that's really important in other scenarios, and how engaged they typically are, where they are, those things are really important in terms of building not just a marketing strategy, but a sales strategy, a growth strategy, and they all feed into to ultimately how our funding structure works in the UK, which is predominantly through UK Sport and Sport England. So we're seeing a massive, a massive focus and emphasis on these products and these services, and a product like ours that sits at the core is really, really important, but without these other complementary solutions that, that connect in, ultimately we won't we will never be able to streamline these journeys as effectively as we need to so that's again just kind of going back to that very first point the more partners we can bring in that deliver these critical services the better we can make the experience for the user hopefully that gives the ngb a much better access to data the data that's going to be really important to them from from a number of in a number of areas um, and ultimately that's that's the way that the national governing bodies and, and other organizations within the sector are gonna be able to progress because it's having that knowledge that really enables you to make intelligence-based decisions. And we're seeing a, a real desire to deliver on that. I think where we all come in, Mark, ourselves, and other key stakeholders in the industry is providing that guidance. And I think more important than ever is us being able to provide that level of support as well as just giving the technology and, and you know, not wanting to do any sort of sales pitch, but that's really where we specialize. You know, we are, we are marks the same and that's why we get on really well is we specialize in everything that comes around the tech. You know, it's all about trying to understand what the end goals are and, and working closely with, with all of those organizations that are important in the sector. Yeah, it's just making it sort of user friendly for everybody, isn't it? Just understanding what's potential. So I suppose, Mark, you, you sort of said the table tennis film was a bit of an exemplar for you. Sort of, so, so what are the highlights out of that that you, you know to bring to attention that, that that make you say that? I think table tennis England have always been quite good at um, member engagement. So if you uh, participate in table tennis to any level, um, you are likely a member of uh, table tennis England. Um, what they are actually quite good at is unpacking that and the value in that, the, the fact that they've got a relatively large membership um, and they're very keen to add value to it. So they are working with uh, Sport 80 and us in, in continuing to engage clubs, for example, and offering more uh, features for clubs, offering more support for clubs to run themselves are, are in a, a digital sense. Uh, it's very early days there, but we're in conversation to build out a number of, uh, of features that will further support clubs and their members and their participants and just make the whole experience of the sport feel richer. Yeah, I know Johnny and I have talked about this sort of quite a bit and sort of the work we're trying to do to create that sort of club solution, because that's where most people's engagement with the sport will be, isn't it? It's just, uh, you know, their sort of local club or within the other people in their local community. So are there any sort of really good examples of what that's sort of looking like? And and I suppose the big question for me sometimes is, is the um, are, are those who are running local clubs digitally enabled themselves ready to, to, to take that on? Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think of some of the people that I know that are club committee members yeah. who have been struggling with Zoom over the last year. I sort of, you know, I, I, seriously, there may be some weaknesses in the system of individuals who are not probably as tech savvy as quite a lot of the younger users that they're they're working with. So I suppose it's just trying to get us all up to a similar level, isn't it? Yeah, and I think a lot of clubs, clubs and leagues rely heavily on experts in the sport, you know, and and some of those experts are uh, unfortunately getting a little bit long in the tooth. Uh, and, and so, and, and whilst trying to be polite here, you know, 
one of the things that we're trying to do is kind of uh, is, is, is take on board their skill to virtualize, to digitize yeah. their skill, if you like, yeah. so that so that it can be passed on, so that more people can can take part in the administration of the club, for example, and so that that club can do a better job of uh, well, automate more of what it does, if you like. So take it from pieces of paper and Excel spreadsheets and turn it into a bit more of a living, breathing thing that can be shared and analysed. Yeah, and actually, a very serious point, just um, particularly around so digital exclusion isn't just sort of in that sort of sense, but increasingly as you know the sport england uniting the movement and others is about tackling inequalities so i just wonder if you've come across any examples where you know digital exclusion happens because of levels of poverty or sort of access to uh either either, either the technology that makes this possible you know there's lots of examples haven't they over the last year or so with families surviving on one mobile phone in a housing block trying to do their their education and, and teaching and um you know I, 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 again be really interesting from your perspective what you've learned from how what access is like to the digital offer from the individual's point of view i mean the, the, there is obviously exclusion um social exclusion is a thing it's a problem for for for, for our for, for this country it it remains true however that most households have a mobile phone for example yeah. so if um, what we produce, for example, is kind of mobile friendly and can be accessed from that device and can be shared through family. You have engagement irrespective of social setting or, or, yeah. or any of that good stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 No, that, that, that's really helpful, Mark, because it just shows you sort of aware of the need to, you know, to make these things accessible as widely as possible, because the last thing we'd want to do is, is, you know, just create another set of exclusion through social uh, mobility or sort of through these these issues that have been highlighted. So that that's that's really helpful. And I assume, Johnny, you're, you're taking those on board in the design and the and the way that trying to make things as accessible as possible right across the piece. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was just going to touch on that, Andy. I think a big part of all of this is about future proofing the sports yeah. for, yeah. for further ge or future generations it's the thing that we are all tackling at the moment is a there is a disparity between the the level of technical capability i would say of certain people from certain generations through to others and that is a challenge that everybody in every sector is facing at the moment when it comes to the obvious solution to everything that we're doing in terms of streamlining efficiencies economies of scale all of these things come down to using technology we do have a need to try and service people that do either find it difficult to use it, yeah. don't necessarily have the skills or don't have access to the, the devices that they need. The best thing we can do as technology providers is make the technology as accessible as we can. Exactly. Uh, and, and that's exactly what we're doing. It's been a challenge for us over the, over the years to get to condense a platform like ours that provides a lot of services to an MGB it's a, you know, it's a business management tool more than it is anything else really these days. And to condense that down to work on a handset that fits in your hand, yeah. that's, a, that's been a real challenge, but we're making great strides now. And we're, we're deploying um, tests and audits from an access, a web access, a bit, ooh, accessibility <laughs> perspective, get my words out. We're deploying these audits and tests at the moment to try and pick out where the gaps are fundamentally. So that is everything from making sure that we have all of the screen reading technology or the technology in place to enable screen readers to work effectively so that we can help visually impaired it's making sure that things are mobile first where possible so that people that only have a mobile device can utilize the tech um, and the big challenge that we've all got right now is what happens about people that don't have access to internet yeah uh, and that's the one we can't solve actually as it stands we can't solve that very easily because that does require another level of infrastructure that is often quite quite tricky but but primarily it's about future proofing we know the world is moving in this direction we know that at some point take a table tennis england as an example and i'm just plucking this out of thin air but just every sport is very similar the people that have been delivering the sport on the ground for the last 20 30 years at some point won't be there to deliver it anymore and i don't think there's any secrets around that getting volunteers in and taking on those roles is a challenge that's been a challenge for a number of years and it will continue to be so implementing technology that is familiar to future generations that will enable them to deliver some of these services and it doesn't take them all weekend with paperwork all over their dining table. They can do it in their hand while sat on the sofa. 
those things are super important, I think, in terms of developing the future of the sports and, and creating this level of sustainability. So yeah. um, that was just touching on, on from Mark's perspective and our perspective, like how all of this, why all of this is so important, we think. Um, and I can't remember the other question now, Andy, because I've just babbled for... No, 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 you, no I think you, you covered it. It was around that sort of te technology <laughs> and accessibility and just sort of making it re absolutely relevant. So it's just being aware of that, isn't it? I think, it, like you said, the accessibility for visually impaired, for example, there's a, a variety of um, ways that sports can exclude people. So if we're working hard to minimise them, that's, that's really, really helpful. Uh, I suppose, Mark, just as, as well, I mean, you said at the beginning, obviously, you know, you've done a variety of work not just in sport but wider in physical activity and I assume in some other areas as well are there any lessons that other sectors or other parts of the sector of you know sort of further ahead than us and we, we can sort of pick up on because well, I think Johnny and I have said in previous podcasts it just feel we're a little bit behind probably some of the other you know fintech and uh, probably the one that everybody uses the examples of hotel bookings and uh, and others you know just just know from your own email feed and social media and stuff that pops up the notifications on your phone how everyone else is following my data and where i am and is able to target messages to us yeah. the stuff that more stuff that we could do to really be competing with those who are sort of best to show yeah i mean i don't think it's a case of uh, competition to be honest with you andy i think kind of often what's lost sight of in in, in engaging people is the people themselves data as a collective term um, is kind of very easy to talk about and you tend to kind of aggregate people and cohorts and types and uh, segments of data and so on. What's really, really important uh, and, and something that, you know, kind of we're, we're very keen to bear in mind when designing any software is it's an individual that ends up using it. You know, yeah. somebody looking at a screen, looking at a device who basically wants to get from A to B. So yeah. kind of that process is, is, is super important, you know, when designing any piece of software. Uh, and, and it's something that can be overlooked in the sector that Johnny and I work in. Uh, you know, we work in data. It's not easy to display some of the information that we need to display, as Johnny was saying, on smaller screen sizes, for example. Yeah. So the process of getting there and sense checking it against the user base is, is super important and possibly something that, that, that the sector needs to kind of do more of, you know, just getting inside the head of, of the end user. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes back to that bigger philosophical question, which I think is emerging about what is membership and what do, how do people want to engage and, and what does it what it mean to them? Yeah, I suppose I was saying in, in sense of competition, but there's a slight competition for our time and our attention. Um, yeah. you, probably, you probably both know the stats better than I do about how many notifications and pieces of information are thrown at us now through our phones on an average day. So I suppose I'm just sort of you're right. It isn't a competition per se, but actually, you know, I, I'm being bombarded with all sorts of messages from different social media channels and how the sport capture that and and in a way that leads on nicely I've just been reminded I suppose is the Olympics and Paralympics happening at the moment uh you, I'm sort of doing some programs this week on radio talking about the inspiration and you know what will this lead to given post Olympics and Paralympics of uh, the NGBs have, have obviously lost members and lost numbers of people who are interested how do you think they can use technology to sort of that interest in the Olympics and Paralympics? And does that inspire, you know, inspire a generation thing? Is there a good way, a good model, as you've seen, of how people use that to then entice people to get them to the local club and to get that sense of enjoyment that you can get from playing a, a new sport? I think it's a good question, Anne. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, either way, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I generally ask it because I'm not quite sure I seen the sort of anything that stands out to me at this stage. Is you, obviously probably more across it than I am. If you've seen some good examples of, uh, of that, I think there are some good examples actually. And I was just going to touch on there are two really big opportunities that have come about in the last two years, and they're both well. One of them's obvious is the Olympics and Paralympics. It being delayed um, has, has led to that being an opportunity this year. The pandemic has offered out an opportunity to national governing bodies to capitalise on, I think, a newfound knowledge for who they are and why they're here. Because at this moment in time, what we, what we are experiencing is, and I'll use British fencing as an example in the UK, a really good example of an NGB who, without their advice and guidance, their participants, whether they were a, 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 an active member or whether they were a reluctant member, 
um, people didn't necessarily always have the best relationship with their national governing body because often the feeling is I'm paying the fee because I have to because I want to compete and they that relationship has changed slightly because without the national governing body sport wouldn't have been able to function in this last 12 18 months and there's a massive opportunity to capitalize off the back of that in terms of that new engagement that people have with who their national governing body is and why they're really here yeah. and what the, the conversations that we've been involved in significantly has been how do we create a compelling reason for people to come and spend their money with us as a national governing body if yeah. That's what we're trying to achieve. We talked at the very beginning about, you know, the, the cold hard fact is that we want membership numbers to rise so that, that we can generate income. Yeah. Income may need to come from other areas. And I know that the majority of the, the NGBs that we work with are, are, are actively exploring what these revenue streams could be. And there is a, a, another huge opportunity, which is my second point, is it's at the grassroots level where traditionally there's kind of almost two ways that an ngb operates is that most of the relationships are direct with the ngb and, and i'll use fencing as that example i may be a member of a club but i know if i want to go and compete in an event i have to go to british fencing and i buy a membership so there's quite a direct relationship there already that's sometimes where you create that reluctant member kind of scenario it's that i didn't get to choose to shop at tesco sainsbury's or waitrose i just had to shop at one of them, I just got told that's the only one. And therefore, whatever, whether they're the best service or not, I'm going to complain about it. Then we also have the rugby's of this world, whereby actually your relationship, although you have one with the RFU, quite typically, it's a secondhand relationship. Your yep. relationship really is with your club. And there are probably less informed individuals that don't necessarily have access to the information that you have. They wouldn't even know that they remember the, the RFU <laughs> all, all together. They just play yeah. their subs and yeah. they play every week and they train. That's the market where the opportunity lies. And the Olympic Games gives a really big shot window. We often see this spike off the back of the, the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games where people have seen it on TV. They're now going to go online and they're going to search for something. And there are some really, really good things going on with Open Data and Open Active around trying to funnel that interest back through to service providers such as ourselves, Rocker, other companies that are providing opportunities for people to get active. But ultimately, the opportunity for the NGBs is in harnessing that desire for people to come and find the sport and get people through the funnel and understand at the minimum who they are. Because at the moment, that's a really scratchy kind of plate position for everybody. Clubs kind of know who those people are. Some clubs operate really professionally. Some will just be doing it on scraps of paper. And those people that come in interested in September will be gone by October because they'll have come and had a go and they'll have decided, well, I'm not really sure, and the club hasn't necessarily come back to them, and that's it, gone. If we can find a way, which we're, we're um, Mark can probably talk about some of this, but we are working on with a, with a club solution at the moment that we've, we've designed and built to be integrated fully into our national governing body ecosystem to, to enable that NGB to, to hopefully give the club something, which is great for a relationship, and B, to try and find a way for us to make sure that that person is never lost that person who just decides to have a quick Google of fencing <laughs> at the end while they're watching it on the on the TV, and then maybe they find a club that's near them and they go along to a session. We want to start understanding who that person is and at what point are they dropping out, or can we even stop that from happening? And that a lot of that is actually, if we understand what's happening at the top of the sport, at the NGB level, the service level to the club can completely transform because it might not be about doing anything with that person's data for the NGB, it might be that we can now deliver more services to the clubs to make sure that they get the most out of that person. But at the moment, we don't even know that person exists. And therefore, we think that's the biggest opportunity. And we haven't really seen anything like this ourselves anyway in the market. There's lots of solutions out there delivering these type of services to clubs. There's the likes of ourselves and a few others that deliver what we deliver to the NGBs with elements of club functionality whereby where the NGB's relationship is involved but there's no one that's kind of bringing all of that together and Mark I don't know I know that we've had a number of conversations on that data piece and our kind of dream kind of god scenario of being able to see the flashing lights as to where everybody's active at any one time but kind of that, yeah. the foundation of that is from that really isn't it yeah it's kind of my, my secret plan to rule the world I think from a perspective I, I, I think that yeah, to, to kind of just expand on uh, your question around the Olympics and the Paralympics, what's going on at the moment, particularly with the way 
excuse me, um, <laughs> more, uh, particularly with the way that Team GB are doing at the moment, is that you're going to get a lot of very enthusiastic, potentially new people to sport flooding the market and wanting to get on board. I think that possibly a trick that's being missed in the sport at the moment is kind of what you do with that individual once they're on board, how you keep them engaged, how you monitor how they're doing, how they're kind of improving in the sport and, you know, what they're taking part in. Um, so the, the, the club's platform that, that we're working on collectively starts to unpack that problem. So it represents uh, something that clubs can use to offer up bookings through a, a free to use website, for example. It, they can even deploy things like programs uh, where an athlete can improve um, their sporting ability in their chosen sport. And there's a companion app as well, which allows that athlete to check in and check out the club and what that does in the background is give you a very, very accurate um, um, participation record. So there's a whole kind of um, a data piece in the background which shows how much engagement you've got that um, Johnny and I are kind of talking about um, expanding upon so that you can see the whole journey of that individual from grassroots right up to kind of whatever the level they want to get to, really. Oh, that's, yeah, that, that, that's brilliant. And, and particularly, I suppose the, the big question for all of us is, is probably slightly wider than you can, you can cover today. But, you know, if there is that initial interest, even if they don't then turn up at the club, but just trying to make sure that sport in general has a, has a, is part of their journey. So it, they might have been interested in fencing, probably didn't join a club, it was too far away, or they didn't, then didn't quite fancy it, but they've seen something else, or there might be something else that's appropriate to them. It's just how we as an ecosystem are able to keep that person inside that system and uh, and, and continually speak to them. Um, I don't have an answer probably just yeah, but that would be ideal, wouldn't it, Mark? You know, I, I yes. get it. I have this lo lovely vision of this a massive dashboard where I know all 65 million people in the UK are and what messages yeah. will work for each of them to get them physically active. Absolutely. I mean, kind of, uh, uh, well, we're, we're all involved in sport, but kind of from a, from a, an individual, from somebody starting out in their chosen sport, I think kind of what you've got there is a passion for something. Somebody wants to do something. And unlike, you know, as he said earlier, getting some car insurance or booking a hotel, all of which have super slick processes attached to them, you don't actually really want to do that. <laughs> what you do want to do is play something, is play with your friends, is meet new people, is get out there in the community and take part in something. So really, you know, we're pushing at an open door, hopefully, in terms of engagement. What we need to get better at is just keeping the journey going, allowing people to kind of open up into the space that they want to explore, irrespective of what sport is. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. So we're coming towards an end now, but we, we started off with a challenge of, you know, the numbers um, uh, you know, have been pretty difficult for national governing bodies and the wider sport and physical activity sector over this COVID period. You know, what's it, just as we sort of conclude really, but what's your analysis? What, how do you feel we'll be able to sort of uh, cover those numbers? What sort of time scale are we put in? And is there anything else, you know, that we, we need to do to make sure that just on, not on just the data side, but other parts of the offer are there that will entice people sort of back in? Um, I think you've mentioned some of them already, Mark, you know, that fun. It's going to be fun, hasn't it? You know, after a year, 18 months of lockdown, we've got to offer something that's really just quite good fun. Um, but yeah, is there anything either of you, you know, what's your prognosis? Are we going to, we're going to be okay? <laughs> Yeah, from my perspective, 100%. Yeah, better than okay. You know, I, um, yeah, glass half full kind of guy. I think you, you've got the diehards in, in who are going to go straight back to the sport that they love. But, you know, I, I, I genuinely think the whole country wants to get back to just doing something which isn't being inside. You know, so there's the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. and just to echo that, Andy, I think we we will be okay. I think the landscape will be different. I don't think I think it will be interesting to see where the numbers get to next year. And you know, if we're just looking at our kind of benchmarks, our membership numbers, I, I think that will change. I think our, our parameters are going to be slightly different. And kind of just just to touch back on that whole partnership piece, there are other. There are other organisations that we're really keen to bring into this ecosystem to deliver exactly what you were just saying, actually, Andy, which is the more we can understand about the people that are involved in different ways, 
the better or the more compelling we can make the reason for people to, to remain involved in sport, whatever sport that is. And we need to understand more about those people as people. What are their interests? What do they do outside of the fact we know they pay £40 a year for a membership and they happen to live in a particular part of the country? That's great, but they've already done that. And, and by understanding more about these people, and that, that again comes back to the data piece and the technology and all the things that we're, we're all trying our best to implement, those things are going to be the most powerful pieces for, for, for the recovery, I think, in terms yeah. of is being able to deliver further on that initial, let, we know people are going to want to do stuff, that's going to be really good. And then it's about how do we go, okay, five years down the line, what's going to keep people coming back and making those offers more compelling. And the traditional membership may well still have its place, but I think there will be other things that, that we'll all develop together as part of a, an ongoing strategy. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I'm a half glass full as well, Mark. So I, just given, you know, just the two rugby clubs I'm involved in, just seeing the number of uh, people who are down training and eager to go. Uh, I don't think, yeah, I don't think it's got anything to particularly worry about. I think numbers are probably about 50, 60 percent up on sort of previous times in in sort of training. And, and to your point as well, Johnny, um, you know, clearly getting too old for doing some of these things. I, I need to transition. I don't I, I shouldn't be lost from the sports system just because yeah. I work in sort of on the RFU's database. I need to be on golf's database or or, or walking football's database. It's, it's for all of us. It goes back to your points. Keeping us in the ecosystem is the vital thing here, not necessarily being in a linear membership sort of system that just, you know, quite rightly, you, they want the income, but uh, there, there has to be a slightly different offer as we all uh, move around a lot more quickly. We'll have a market, uh, supermarket.com for sport. You know, <laughs> your, cheapest, your cheapest NGB. No, I shouldn't <laughs> compare all those offers look this has been brilliant hopefully it's also a little bit of um, a pick up for those who are involved in looking forward to you know fully reopening and the, the challenges ahead is that you know you, you've got their back um, we're here to help through Sport 80 and obviously what Mark's been doing at uh, Rocker uh, it just really yeah thanks ever so much for just uh, being so positive really I mean challenges as you say ahead um, but there are people if we all work collaboratively together there are a number of solutions to get this membership and the sort of the the health and strength of our national governing bodies back up to where they were pre-covid and, and it's thanks to people all of us um back office front office coaches etc are just making that environment as welcome and, and as easy as possible so thanks for for all that you're doing and um, we'll look forward to checking back in with you in six months to see how how right we all were fingers crossed <laughs> <laughs> thanks then both really enjoyed thanks, Thank you. Cheers, cheers, guys.